He's the head of the Division of General Surgery for Fraser Health, a clinical professor for the Division of Surgery at UBC. He has recently been a member of the Provincial Breast Health Strategy Clinical Pathway Committee, as well as the BCCA Breast Cancer Screening Policy Review Committee. He is currently chair of the BCCA Surgical Oncology Network Breast Tumor Committee, and he is here today to speak in support of the Canadian Task Force recommendations for screening for the age 40 to 49. Please welcome Dr. Turner. Thank you, Dr. Cullen, for your um, kind um, introduction. Um, and uh, welcome, Dr. Mohammed, who's my uh, opponent. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I'm going to uh, talk to you a little bit about the recommendations of the Canadian Task Force on Preventive Health Care with respect to screening of women uh, with mammography and other methods between the age of 40 and 49. Um, I plan to uh, give you a little bit of information about the rationale that led them to these recommendations and, and also to put this in the context of the findings from the, from the uh, BC uh, Screening Mammography Program and uh, end up with some possible thoughts or ideas about where we might um, move ahead from here. So the, the task force, um, uh, the task, Canadian Task Force on Preventive Health Care set out to give recommendations for mammography, MRI, breast self-examination and clinical breast examination to screen for breast cancer for women at average risk. And they were very careful to define what they considered to be women at average risk. And these recommendations were published in the CMA Journal in November 2011. The Canadian Task Force on Preventive Health Care was previously known as the Canadian Task Force on, Pre on the Periodic Health Examination. That group was disbanded in 2005, but was started up again with a new name in 2010. And it's funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada and the um, Canadian Institute of Health Research, supported by an evidence review center at McMaster University. And its mandate is to develop clinical practice guidelines for preventive care um, based on the best scientific evidence available. Now, I've deliberately here uh, laid out exactly the wording of the recommendations as they appear in the article in the CMA Journal in November 2011, because if you look at it, you'll see that their, their wording has been very, very careful. So for women aged 40 to 49 years, we recommend not routinely screening with mammography, and they describe this as a weak recommendation. Now their definition of a weak recommendation is as follows. Many, most women would accept this, but many would not, and that's their definition. The evidence, unfortunately, is only moderate quality, and the problem is that there are really very few really good randomized prospective studies, and, and even those studies that are available do have some problems with um, randomization. There, there really is no evidence at this point to recommend routinely screening with MRI scans, and that really is not at all controversial. Next, we recommend not routinely performing clinical breast examinations alone or in conjunction with mammography to screen for breast cancer, and we recommend not advising women. So these are very specific recommendations that they've made, and part of the reason for this is that, like it or like it not, uh, there, is, there is no evidence that, that these maneuvers improve outcomes, but they certainly lead to more anxiety and more breast biopsies. So in summary, they, again, this is their exact words, they could find no evidence that screening women at average risk in the 40 to 49 age group using MRI, clinical breast examination, or breast self-examination led to any measurable outcome benefits. So what criteria did they consider in making these recommendations? Really what they're trying to look at is the benefit to harm ratio. And, and primarily, the only real benefit that they could look at in a statistical, measurable manner was, was mortality. The harms, of course, are a little more difficult to quantitate. And cost effectiveness, which is defined as qu cost per quality adjusted life year, is also very difficult to get a handle on. But it becomes really important, especially in the, in the field of, of, of public health policy. So, 
they did actually find on review of the material that there is a 15% reduction in the risk-adjusted mortality from breast cancer in the age group 40 to 49 with screening. The problem is that the annual mortality due to breast cancer in this age group is only 1.84 per 10,000 women. And this means that if you screen 1,000 women every two years for 10 years, there will be 0.5 fewer deaths as a result. So the outcome benefit is really relatively small. To put this in another way and to compare it with women of older age, you'll see from this, this slide that the annual mortality per 100,000 women is considerably higher in the 50 to 59 age group and the 60 to 69 age group. And so that the deaths avoided per 1,000 per screened again is significantly higher in the 50 to 59 age group than it would be in the 40 to 49 age group. And so the number needed to screen to prevent one death in the 40 to 49 age group is two in excess of 2,000, whereas in the 50 to 59 age group, it's only 721. Now, how do we put this in the context of the findings from our own uh, screening mammography program? In the 40 to 49 age group, and this is based on the SMPBC annual report, for, uh, which came out in 2011. The, the, the next one is due to come out very soon for 2012. But based on uh, a five-year uh, period from 2006 to 2010, uh, during which there were 488,000 screens carried out on women uh, between age 40 and 49, the participation rate over the province was, uh, was 46%. And this varies considerably by region. Now, overall in those women, about 90 per 1,000, or about 8.9% actually, had an abnormal screening mammogram, whereas the uh, overall cancer detection rate was only 2.1 per 1,000. And of those, about 30% were DCIS. Interestingly, of the cancers that were found, the majority were less than 15 millimeters in size and, and were node negative, so they were low-risk cancers. So those are the benefits. Now, the potential harms that are described by the, by the um, task force, first of all, uh, consi consi consist of, of a false positive result. Now, what they mean by a false positive result is an abnormal screening mammogram. And an abnormal screening mammogram, of course, leads to further diagnostic studies and sometimes biopsies. The result of this, of course, is, is considerable anxiety and discomfort for the patients and, and further radiation exposure. It's quite difficult to get a true handle on the significance of, of those, um, th those, those uh, um, harms. Um, and overdiagnosis is, is an additional harm, which is even more difficult to really quantitate. You can see that the, the estimates um, vary wildly from 1% to 30%. And overdiagnosis really means detection of lesions that would not have become apparent without screening. And it's a very, very difficult thing to get a, get a handle truly on. So if we look again at the different age groups uh, and try to examine the number of adverse events following screening mammography in the different age groups, you'll see that the, the number of so-called false positive um, mammograms is, is really very similar per thousand screened in the 40 to 49 and 50 to 69 age groups and the actual number per thousand screened of unnecessary, so-called unnecessary biopsies is very similar. But when you translate that into per death prevented, you find, as we said before, that the number needed to screen is at least three times as many in the women aged 40 to 49. And this means, therefore, that you've got approximately three times as many um, abnormal mammograms per breast cancer discovered in the 40 to 49 age group. And this also results in what the task force calls unnecessary biopsies in almost three times as many patients in that age group. So if you look at the, um, the SMP uh, BC annual report for 2011, uh, you'll see that there were eight, nearly 9,000 women screened in this age group in 2010. And so what were these harmful diagnostic procedures that were done? The great majority of them were, were uh, a great majority of the women uh, had mammograms, 
quite a high percentage had ultrasound examinations, and relatively few went on to biopsies. The most common kind of biopsy was a core biopsy. Um, surgical biopsies made up about 3% of the cases who had abnormal mammograms, and of those, um, two, of, two out of the 3% were actually wire-guided procedures. So it may mean that they weren't amenable to biopsy by any other technique. Now, cost effectiveness is another aspect that is extremely difficult to get a handle on. There was, um, as, as uh, you, you may be aware, the screening mammography program of British Columbia is currently in the process of revising its guidelines. And in the process of doing this, they, they, um, they uh, had a, a review of effectiveness and cost effectiveness evidence done, uh, prepared in 2011. And the best estimates suggest that the cost per quality adjusted life year for women in the 40 to 49 age group is anywhere from 150 to 310,000, depending on how often the women are screened. In contrast, the cost, the, the, the cost per quality adjusted life year in the 50 to 59 age group is around 40 to 86,000. Now, in international circles of, of, of public health, in general, um, $50,000 is considered cost effective per quality adjusted life year. So by these criteria, it, it does not appear to be cost effective to screen women with mammography in this age group. So this begs the question, well, if we're not going to screen women at average risk, how could we change things so that we would only select those women between 40 and 49 years of age whose whose risk, whose, whose harm to benefit ratio would become the same as those women in the 50 to 59 age group. And this was very interestingly um, looked at by two papers in the same, um, uh, the same uh, edition of Annals of Internal Medicine earlier this year. And these reviews found that a woman in the 40 to 49 age group who doubles her, uh, doubles her average risk would then have the same harm to benefit ratio as a woman in the 50 to 59 age group. And when the risk factors were reviewed, it, it, was, it was found that, that having a first degree relative with breast cancer or having extremely dense breasts would double the risk for development of breast cancer in this age group and therefore would put a woman in the same category as the 50 to 59 age group, thereby making a breast screening uh, by mammography, both cost-effective and, and reasonable. So this begs the question that maybe women should be actually having a risk assessment by their family practitioner at the age of 40. The only problem being is that the only way to determine density of the breasts is to do a mammogram. And so you're forced back to doing a mammogram on everybody to see if they have dense breasts. But I think Really, what we're going to have to do is await the, the new guidelines um, for the screening mammography program of British Columbia, which will, will help you, I think, to make decisions in this regard. So the current BC screening policy is, is very clearly laid out. And they actually do recommend uh, self-examination. They do recommend clinical breast examination. And they do recommend starting with regular screening mammograms at the age of 40. But keep your ears open, because I think you'll find later this month that this will all change. So the screening mammography program currently offers screening mammography to all eligible women aged 40 to 79 without a doctor referral. And of course, there are eligibility uh, criteria. It's interesting that this isn't consistent across the provinces. Um, the majority of provinces actually don't even screen women between age 40 and 49. In Alberta and New Brunswick, um, a physician referral is, is required. And as was pointed out in the, uh, the cost-effectiveness review, um, this variation reflects the, the, the controversies and complexities in this field. So there is no absolute consistency. And so once again, I, I'm quoting the exact words of the task force, stating that in their judgment, the ratio of benefit to harm does not justify routine mammographic screening in women aged 40 to 49, but they go on to say that clinicians should discuss the benefits and harms with their patients and must help each woman to make a decision that is consistent with her values and preferences. So it's really throwing it back to the family doctor 
and ultimately back to the patient to make the decision according to the task force. The problem with all of this is that the evidence is not entirely clear, and so the conclusions cannot be entirely clear. And so when all is said and done, all we can really do is to do what is reasonable under the circumstances for the public health policy, the spending of money, uh, for physicians, and for, um, for the patients themselves. And there really honestly is no one right answer to all of this. So I'm, I'm going to be very interested to hear Dr. Mohammed's uh, counter-arguments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Turner. And we also have Dr. Islam Mohammed com coming from Kelowna this morning. He's a radiation oncologist practicing in Kelowna, completed his undergraduate degree in genetics and medical degree at the University of Alberta, then his residency at the Cross Cancer Institute. Dr. Mohammed has specialized in lung and breast cancer since starting his practice in 2000. He also treats cancers of the skin, muscle, and bone. Frustrated by the limitations of radiotherapy in treating advanced cancers, Dr. Mohammed is an active clinical researcher and has become involved in the cancer control and cancer care advocacy. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Mohammed. So yes, I'm a radiation oncologist practicing in Kelowna, but I, I want to get right to the talk here because Dr. Turner has thrown down the gauntlet with these recommendations and I really feel compelled to respond. I want, I want the audience to help me uh, understand uh, the, the substance of these recommendations because this is going to be a very challenging case to, to counter. It seems to me that Dr. Turner has clearly demonstrated that there is a, an increase in mortality from perform, performing breast self-examination. Do I have that right? No, I don't have that right? It must be then that he's demonstrated an increase in mortality from clinical breast examination. Do I have that right? Is that why we should reject it? No? He went on for a bit about mammography. He must have demonstrated then that there's an increase in mortality from performing mammography in women aged 40 to 49. Did he show that? No. No, in fact, he showed that there's a decrease in mortality, a 15% decrease. And so I'm confused here because I thought that the Canadian task force was about reducing harm. But it sounds like if we adopt the Canadian task force recommendations, we will predictably in, uh, increase the number of preventable deaths among women in their 40s in Canada. I think I've got that right. So let's look at these recommendations again quickly. We recommend not advising women to routinely practice breast self-examination. We recommend not routinely performing breast examinations alone or in conjunction with mammography by physicians like yourselves. And for women 40 to 49 years of age, we recommend not routinely screening for breast cancer with mammography. But this flies in the face of, uh, of reason. And the take-home message for women in their 40s, once they heard these recommendations announced, is don't check your breasts. For God's sakes, don't let doctors check your breasts. And don't have a mammogram until you're 50. That's the substance of these recommendations, these weak recommendations. But this contradicts a couple of decades of public health education. We've been telling our patients for years to be aware of their breasts, that screening saves lives, and that they should be fighting breast cancer and not be complacent. And it also flies in the face of a couple of decades of the benefits in the screening era of this increased vigilance. You can see here uh, three jurisdictions of incidence and mortality trends in the US, the UK, and in Canada showing that despite an increasing incidence in the screening era, primarily attributable to DCIS being detected, there is declining mortality. And some of that must be attributable to, to screening mammography. So let's talk about breast self-examination. The studies that were used by the Canadian Task Force to make their recommendations with regard to breast self-examination were also reviewed in a Cochrane meta-analysis updated in 2008. The analysts of that report used the primary endpoint of mortality as the lone criterion for judging whether or not to include a study. They also wanted to see that it was a randomized study, but it had to be mortality as the endpoint. And what they found, you can see the forest plot there, what they found was that there is no breast cancer mortality benefit from performing breast self-examination in these studies that were conducted in Russia and Shanghai. 
the Russian data, the analysts actually rejected the Moscow data because they thought that data was too dodgy, so they relied only on the St. Petersburg data. So this recommendation is coming from a breast self-exam interventional study performed in Russia, in St. Petersburg, and in Shanghai. Let's look at the study that the Cochrane analysis excluded. This is a study that was done in Belfast in 28,788 women aged 40 to 74. They were randomized to either an intervention with breast self-examination booklet provided by the GP at baseline or at 12 months or no intervention. They did not measure mortality as a primary endpoint, but what did they measure? They measured the number of breast abnormalities, which was the same in both groups, so this wasn't surfacing a, a bunch of ridiculous physical findings. They also measured the proportion of breast cancers that were of early stage, and they found there were 53.6% in the breast self-exam group and 24.3% in the no uh, intervention group. And they also measured the average tumor size between these two groups. And you could see that it was 24 millimeters for breast self-exam and 33 millimeters for the no intervention group. So what outcomes are measured by breast self-exam here? Mortality, no, there's no benefit there. But you find tumors at earlier stage, and you find them smaller with breast self-examination. Let's look at clinical breast exam. The Canadian Task Force says that there was no evidence found to show that there's a reduced mortality using clinical breast exam, and they cited the U.S. Task Force report from 2009. If you look at the U.S. Task Force, they said that there were three trials designed to determine mortality outcomes by using clinical breast exam as the primary screening approach, but that these were performed in countries without robust healthcare resources. So that stands to reason that these, the results of these studies are suspect. If you're finding breast cancers early, but you don't have a robust medical system that can cure them, then are you going to enjoy a mortality benefit? That doesn't seem likely. And although they held this high standard in terms of mortality in evaluating these studies, they didn't have, hold themselves to as high a standard in speculating about the harms. They said that a theoretical harm of clinical breast exam is that its lower specificity than mammography will result in more women undergoing biopsy. And at the same time, in the same breath, they say, but there's actually no data that that's true. So their rigor is somewhat suspect here. And so what's an up-to-date general practitioner like yourselves to do, somebody who's conducting evidence-based medicine? Well, I, I'd like to get some help from the audience here. Has anybody performed an annual physical examination on a patient earlier this week? Anybody? Yeah. Could you stand up, please, sir? Just help me out with a couple of questions. <clears throat> Thank you. So did you, did you listen to your patient's lungs? Did you listen to their heart? Did you take their blood pressure? Did you examine their abdomen for hepatosplenomegaly? Did you take their pulse? Did any of those assessments have level one evidence, randomized controlled trial evidence <laughs> of a reduction in mortality? And what the hell were you doing them for? <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> That's, that's the standard that the Canadian Task Force wants to apply to these examinations. That's the standard that Dr. Kerner, as a proponent of this, wants to apply. And it's preposterous. Of course it's preposterous. So you can imagine a conversation at an annual physical going something like this. New medical reports say there is no survival benefit to my examining you or taking a history for your annual checkup. So I guess we're done. I'll see you next year. <clears throat> Let's go on to mammography. I think we can dispense with that recommendation. Mammography in 40 to 49-year-olds uh, does show a mortality benefit. There's a 15% benefit cited by the task force's own source documents. It's based on um, analyses like these. This is a Cochrane meta-analysis. This is, again, a forest plot of the eight randomized controlled trials they included in their analysis. This analysis shows a 16% uh, breast cancer mortality reduction in this age group. And that's statistically significant. You can see the 95% confidence interval does not cross one. And that's at 13 years follow-up. But what, what are these data actually showing? If you look at the U.S. Preventative Task Force report, they also cite a 15% mortality reduction. But they're a little more honest about what's happening here. This is the number needed to invite achieves a 15% mortality reduction. So this is the number of women who are invited to participate in a screening program. In these randomized controlled trials, it's about 60 to 70 percent of women are actually participating in the screening. And as far as I understand uh, mammography, I'm just a simple country doctor, but 
as far as I understand mammography, it's actually undergoing a mammogram that detects the early breast cancer, not merely being invited to participate in the screening program. And so the number needed to invite is also a suspect statistic, though they use that statistic in making their recommendations saying 1,904 invitations need to be made in order to prevent one breast cancer death. So the actual results are higher for, for the number needed to screen. So why are we using number needed to invite? Shouldn't we be using the number needed to screen? I'm going to go into a little bit of uncomfortable territory here because we should also be talking about the potential years of life lost and the life years gained. These are meaningful statistics from a public health perspective. No one talks about the potential years of freedom from anxiety or the years of biopsy avoidance gained. Nobody talks about those statistics. We're talking about saving lives here. And not all deaths are created equal. From a public health perspective, from a cultural perspective, from a fiscal perspective, a death of a woman in her 40s is materially different from a death of a woman in her 70s. From a public health perspective, we look at infant mortality as the most significant impact on potential years of life lost, and then up through the decades, there are decreasing impacts. From a cultural perspective, although it's tragic, we do expect to bury our parents, but we don't expect to bury our daughters. And the loss of a, of a wife to a husband or a mother to young uh, children is a much more significant cultural impact. And from a fiscal perspective, if you want to look at crass economics, and Dr. Turner does, um, there is a different impact of somebody dying in their 40s. They're removed, their productivity is removed from the labor force. The dependents on their income no longer have that income available to them. And the revenues that they contribute to our society are then lost. So there are differences in deaths at different decades. So let's look then at the efficiency not by number needed to invite, but by the number needed to screen. And not only by the number needed to screen, but the number needed to screen per life year gain. So you can see what I've highlighted there is that we achieve the best efficiency in the 60 to 69 year age group. We only need to screen 233 to prevent one death. And the number of needed to screen per life year gain is 16. The next most efficient uh, bracket is 50 to 59, and it's only slightly different on the number needed to screen per life year gain. The next most effective bracket is not actually included in the new recommendations of the Canadian Task Force. It's the 40 to 49 year age group, where you have 28 needed to screen per life year gained, because the lives gained in that age group have such a large impact. And the last category in this, oops, sorry, is the 70 to 79 year age group, uh, where you need 40 to screen uh, in order to gain one year of life. So let's talk about the harms that uh, Dr. Turner cites. I think the, the benefits are clear, and there are some estimates that the mortality reduction in the number needed to screen is actually on the order of 35 to 40 percent. And that's, that's an estimate that has been provided in the BC jurisdiction as well by our chief statistician for the screening mammogram program, Andy Colton. But what are patients telling us about the harms that Dr. Turner cites? This uh, these statements come from the Canadian Task Force's own source document, the document that they commissioned in order to make their deliberations. That document clearly states the following, that patients valued test accuracy and mortality reduction and did not consider the potential harms of screening. They cited a study done in the U.S. of women who were screened. Of those 1,500 women, 97% of them said that a false positive result would not prevent them from continuing to participate in the screening program and that they preferred the inconvenience and anxiety of a higher recall rate in return for detecting breast cancer earlier, let alone enjoying a mortality benefit from having that breast cancer detected. So these so-called harms are not material to most women. So what are the proper take-home messages here? Breast self-examination finds smaller cancers. That's what the randomized data shows. Clinical breast examination should remain part of a complete physical examination. Mortality is a ridiculous standard to hold that to. And mammography in 40 to 49 year old women saves lives. So I urge all of you to reject the task force recommendations and to put this resolution to rest. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed. So we've heard from both sides, but before questions, I would like to ask Dr. Turner or Dr. Mohammed, if either of them would like to come up for a reply. <laughs> Dr. Mohammed, of course. Is that all? No, no. 
Dr. Dr. Mohammed, of course, I agree with you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, um, the problem that we, we all face is that um, what we have to try to do is what is reasonable under the circumstances of a public health policy in this, in this province. And so the, the issue that's come before the screening program is how can we get the best um, value for, for money, essentially? And, and where should we be really putting our resources? And so I think you're going to find that um, the, the screening program is probably not likely to come out in quite such a strident fashion as the task force. But perhaps to do what happens in some of the other provinces, which is to say that, that women can be screened in this age group if they're referred by their family doctor. And what this implies is that there's been a, a, a reasonable risk assessment carried out by the family doctor, at, at presumably at the age of 40, um, and, and a reasonable discussion with a woman as to the relative risks and benefits. And, and if the patient and the physician are in agreement, then the screening program may well accept them for screening uh, mammography even at the 40 to 49 age group. Once accepted, it's likely that they would then be recalled. The difference is that the recruitment, the, the, the spending on recruitment and trying to increase participation rate is going to be aimed mainly at the groups that benefit most. So there's efforts to try to bring up the participation rate to 70% um, and efforts to try to reach out to groups that presently are not well uh, served by the screening program, such as people in remote areas, First Nations people, uh, and, and other people who have different cultural backgrounds that may lead them to not participate. So um, finally, the final word, I, you know, I, I'm a simple surgeon. I've always admired oncologists for their ability to, 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 um, to, to look at statistics. And quite honestly, usually when I go to a talk by a, a medical or a radiation oncologist, I usually fall asleep. And I wake up to hear what their conclusion is because I just cannot follow their figures. So I thought my figures were a lot simpler and easier to follow than Dr. Mohammed. So I challenge you to follow my uh, prescription rather than his. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Turner. Dr. Mohammed, do you have anything else to add? Um, I, I didn't expect my opponent to capitulate so quickly. That's, uh, <laughs> I had a lot of other material that I was going to use. Uh, and really, it's true that there, there are a lot of other reasons why we should be rejecting these recommendations. But I think a, a really important one, and, and one of the things that I think uh, we need to consider in our communications to the public and to, to our profession is what these recommendations wind up uh, uh, having as a, as a consequence of their wording. Now, Dr. Turner said that these are very carefully worded guidelines, um, that really the guideline on breast self-examination is that, you know, advising women on performing a particular technique of breast self-examination is not superior to doing nothing at all. Um, but what people wind up hearing and what physicians like myself wind up hearing from these reports is that you shouldn't do breast self-examination, that women should be discouraged from examining themselves. And I think that's a huge risk, first of all, because it contradicts what we've been telling people all along, and second, because it's not true. That's not what the recommendation is saying. And third, because the recommendation itself is weak and based on shoddy evidence. So why would we be reversing and contradicting uh, a dogma, and I think a well-earned dogma, with recommendations that really baffle and undermine the credibility of our, of our uh, community. Um, so I think, it's, I think it's important that the, the task force not merely say things like, well, you know, if uh, women have a conversation with their physician and they're comfortable with the harms, then they can go ahead and have mammography done. Uh, that's not actually what the recommendation was saying. That's kind of all the, the patter that goes in behind it after the recommendation is announced. But the recommendation is saying, we recommend not performing mammography routinely. And that's a very different way to put it. This is a life-saving intervention. 
And so I think that the, that the wording of the recommendation really undermines, like I said, our credibility and the, the uh, education of the public. And what the public perceives is that one study comes out, we reverse our position. Another study comes out, we reverse our position again. We're inconstant. We can't be relied on for consistent recommendations. Uh, and I think that really does a lot of damage to our credibility as a profession. I think, uh, just to respond a little bit, I think the key word that you use there is routinely. And uh, I think, you know, the message in the end, and we'll see what the, the uh, SNPPC ends up saying, but the key word is perhaps not to go out and recruit women in that age group um, lively to enter the program, but rather to, to have a considered recommendation. Uh, the same with breast self-examination. You know, the key here was that uh, not too long ago, there were major expensive programs in Canada. I remember at one point there was a 15-minute video uh, that was well-funded by um, public health agencies on teaching women how to self-examine, um, implying that this was a very difficult process. And I think, again, I think most of us would agree that self-awareness and, and, and being aware of your breasts and being conscious of changes is, is a critical message. So I, I think they, they carefully worded their pronouncements, but you have to read between the lines. And, and that's the and, problem. Exactly. And the difficulty here is that for, for family practitioners and all of us to know what to do. So part of the process of this changing mentality needs to be an education process that, that, that educates uh, all of us uh, about the issues and, and gives us help in, in, in re making recommendations to patients. So I think you're going to see quite a bit of material available in the next while, particularly from the screening, the SNPPC, to help um, guiding women how they should proceed. Thank you very much. I'm sure there are some questions. Would anybody like to come up to the mic? What is the actual harm of the 10 mammograms that a woman would get from 40 to 49 from a radiation exposure standpoint? Because we hear that and women worry about it, but I don't know what to tell them. So the, the randomized control trials that were done, the eight randomized control trials, recruited women that uh, in those studies prior to 1985 for the most part, most of these were single view mammogram studies with technologies that we don't use today and intervals of between 18 to 24 months. And there was still a mortality reduction demonstrated in that cohort. Now, the, the newer mammographic strategies decrease the amount of radiation dose uh, delivered to the breast. Um, and there are new technologies emerging all the time that uh, improve the efficiency with respect to radiation exposure. It's very hard to quantify what that risk is, though, of radiation exposure to increasing the risk of breast cancer. So there is going to be a small increase in the risk of breast cancer as a consequence of these radiation exposures. And of course, we want to do what we can to mitigate that. When you have an abnormal screening mammogram and it triggers an additional mammogram, that becomes problematic. So I'm not up here to say that the mammogram is a perfect screening test. It does have problems. Nevertheless, despite the increased exposure of mammography, we are seeing declining mortality. And, um, and I think that, that, that needs to, that's the bottom line, declining breast cancer mortality, despite the increased risk. So uh, the harm is something that should be considered. It is being considered by public health authorities and the technology um, uh, improvement um, for that uh, intervention. Um, but it's still not bearing um, any significant mortality impact. Just along the, the lines of that, it's, it's interesting that the um, mammography is changing from film mammography to digital mammography. It hasn't uh, completely penetrated the screening program yet. Um, the intriguing thing about digital is that it probably results in less radiation exposure. It's more sensitive, especially in, in younger women. It, it may find smaller cancers, but the disadvantage is that it may lead to more uh, so-called false positives or more abnormal um, mammograms. So once again, you know, it's one step forward, two steps forward, one step back. Thank you. I just wondered if anyone given thought to the larger piece of the psychology of the epidemiology of what will happen, because being around in family medicine for 30 years, I've seen a huge increased awareness of women about their health. But I've also noticed that women who don't engage healthcare before menopause are seldom going to engage it afterwards. So if we tell them they don't have to worry about their breasts, 
and they only have to do that postmenopausally after 50, they're not going to come. Um, it's a training process, it's an awareness process. I've already had women coming into my practice saying, well, didn't you know, doctor, you don't have to worry about breast cancer anymore. I've had medical students coming in saying, you don't have to examine breasts anymore, you're not up to date. Um, so I don't know if anyone's looked at the psychology of that, because certainly I've seen huge benefits of increased awareness. Um, the only breast cancers that are in my practice are the ones I feel, ones they feel, or when mammography picks up. So I'm not sure if they think there's a breast cancer pixie out there who's suddenly going to tell us somebody has breast cancer for not doing any of those things. <laughs> Thank you. you know, there, there was a survey of the uh, women uh, in the 40 to 49 age group in BC having mammograms and asking them why they had the mammograms. And the majority of them actually stated that the reason they had it was because their doctor had recommended it. So I think really this turns, turns us back again to this new step forward where where the onus is going to be back on the, on the patient and the family doctor as to whether or not they decide to go ahead with screening. I think the key here is for us to be very clear about what the benefits and harms are. So when we're discussing this with our patients, yes, we're going to discuss the benefits and harms. The benefit is a substantial mortality reduction, although your risk of death is relatively low. And the harm is there's going to be more tests being performed. So. You know, as long as women are clear about uh, the fact that they're going to have false positive results, they're going to go for more mammograms and ultrasounds, they're going to have biopsies, as long as they're clear about some of those outcomes, if they're interested in producing a small decrease in their mortality, and many women are, uh, they're willing to do anything it would take to do that, uh, then they can participate in the screening program. Thank you.